Y ahora vamos a cambiar un poco de, de, de país, vamos a ir a Estados Unidos. ¿Cuántos de ustedes conocen un astronauta? ¿Cuántos de ustedes conocen una mujer astronauta? Bueno, esa es la persona que le queremos dejar, una persona con un carisma, una cercanía que nos ha impactado también a todos nosotros. Lleva 10 años en la NASA, ella viene directamente los últimos 10 años en la NASA y es la primera mujer astronauta afroamericana. Con todos ustedes, Yvonne Cagle. Thank you, Chile. Oh, rock it out, everybody. Raise it up. Let's rock it out. Put your hands in the air. Hey, woo! All right. I love space. I love Chile. Woo! There is space for all. So, Chile, let's rock it out. Woo! Hi, I'm Yvonne, Dr. Cagle, but I'm Yvonne to you. I've been here a week, and I want to take all of you to space with me. I love you, and I love space. My love of space began when I was little, a child. I sat on mountaintops, huge rocks, just like here in Chile. I feel like I'm a child again, looking at the skies. And one day, I wanted to touch the other side of the mountain. I was a child. I thought it was just a mere few feet. I don't know, maybe a mile, but I could do that. I could cross the valley. And then I woke up one morning and decided I was going to go across the valley. I packed my lunch, peanut butter jelly sandwich, crackers, an apple, some juice. And I started walking. And after about six miles, 12 hours, sunset, I turned around, hot, tired, bested, dejected. I didn't make it. So I had to go home. So I started walking round about dusk, I realized I was hopelessly lost. By the time I made it back to my beloved boulder rock, it was dark. I was hugging that hawk, that rock. I was so relieved to have found my rock again. So then I was close to home and I walked back. Okay, I didn't walk back. I crawled back home, got into my warm kitchen. Now it was night, cold. I was exhausted hungry, and very inconsolable. So after I had a hot meal, a good night's sleep, and about three weeks of restriction, detention from my parents, I thought, wait a minute. My plan isn't entirely flawed. I'm not afraid to go out there again. I don't need to dumb down my reach, I just need smarter feet. Ah, yes, these are my feet. Next time, I'd try a tricycle. Didn't work too well. I got six miles and three feet. Then I figured I was 12 years old and I saw Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. That's what I needed to get to the other side of the mountain. A rocket ship, that should work. But I became a doctor along the way and realized, you know what's better than a rocket ship? Because rocket ships, they need fuel. And anybody here ever run out of gas? Not a good thing on your way to space or the other side of the mountain. I decided what did I need. I needed to become a doctor and learn how to make bionic legs. They never tire out. I'm taking those babies all the way to space. You don't need legs in space, and bionic legs will never get out. They'll keep going and going and going. But to do that, I needed to have a little bit more life experience. Remember, I was only 12. So I became a Girl Scout. 
the Girl Scout motto, be prepared. So I prepared myself. I earned my degree in biochemistry. Then I got a medical degree, my doctor degree, at the University of Washington in the United States, Seattle. After that, I paid my time back as a flight surgeon. That meant I flew in all of these high performance jets. F-111s, F-15s, F-16s, F-18, helicopters, air-to-air -air refuelers, C-141, C-5, medevac, anything going to altitude, I wanted to be in it. I'm so excited. I've got to curb my enthusiasm and slow down. But after a while, astronauts, we can't slow down. I needed to go faster, but not just faster. I needed to go higher. And the only way to get there at that time was the space shuttle. Now, if I could put poetry to motion, I would call it the space shuttle. In less than 10 minutes before you can finish that peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you're 250, not 248, not 249, 250 miles above the Earth. You're going 17,500 miles per hour. Five seconds every time you blink your eyes. Five miles in every blink of the eye. That's how fast you're going. And when you take off your seatbelt, guess what? Do you need solid rocket boosters? No, no, do you need main engines? No, you're in space, you're floating, you're weightless, awesome. So I became an astronaut and a doctor of space. And you know what the next lesson that I learned was? Space is absolutely amazing. There is nothing like space on Earth. But I did find out that in space, as a doctor, you can still lose heart. You can, really, no. Literally, you can lose heart. Did you know the first doctor in space to listen for the heartbeat in his crewmate Guess what he heard? Nada. Nothing. I can imagine what that transmission, that phone call to, to mission control was. Um, Houston, we have a problem. I've lost the heart. Oh, no, no, sir. Um, really, he's fine. He's looking right at me. Matter of fact, he's kind of giggling. He's laughing at me, but I can't, I can't find the heartbeat. My gosh, he was beside himself. But then he happened to slide his stethoscope from the left side of the heart, where your heart lives here in gravity, over to the center of his chest. And guess what he heard? Boom. 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 The heartbeat. He had found the heartbeat again. So in space, you can lose your heart. You can lose your spleen. You can lose your kidneys. You can lose your appendix. You can lose your little brother. Oh, no, no, that's my family. Um, anyway, you can lose your heart because not only do you float, everything inside of you floats too. So in space, the body is so amazing and so versatile that the heart can get lost. And if you're in space without gravity too long, you start to lose muscle and bone because you don't need it in space. But when you come back home, it's kind of nice to make sure you exercise well while you were weightless. The other thing that I learned as an astronaut in training was contingency. Big word that just means stuff happens. But not everything about contingency is bad. Because if you do your homework and flip around a few letters, you find that at the very core of things that can go unexpected, contingency is the word innovation. And that's what 
space is all about. Space on Earth as well as space up high. So right now, we have a spacecraft called Laddie circling the moon. Tonight, when the moon comes out, over there, there, well, anyway, we're, it's up there somewhere. There's a spacecraft circling around. And you know what it's studying? Dust, simple dust. Because when men walked on the moon decades ago, the Apollo astronauts, they saw this red haze. And it's taken us over 35, 40 years to come all the way back, but we're studying it now. Now, this spacecraft is way up here, but it had to get up there. Do you know how it got up there? Anybody want to know how? Almost the same way I got to Chile, except there wasn't an airplane. Somebody had to drive it from the coast of California in the United States 3,000 miles to Virginia to make sure that it didn't fall off the back of the truck. And who did that? 3,000 miles. Talk about the other side of the mountain. But that's what was necessary in order for us to launch it on September 6th. And it did. It was beautiful. And it's been over a month. And it's there doing science now with laser communications. And once we figure out how to make that laser work up there, you all are going to be able to talk to me and anyone all over the world without dropping any calls. I think that's rocking it out. Let's have a round of applause. So let me run through some other innovations that we're working on with space. How many people would like to fly their own experiment up in space? I don't know, would you like to float spiders, crickets, marbles, your little sister? Uh, no, um, let's see, anything that you want to float that you can fit in a tiny cube that's, I don't know, less than the size of a shoebox, it's possible for you to do that in less than nine months and for a lot cheaper than what we pay you or pay, you have to pay us at NASA. So for less than $5,000, a lot of money, but not for an entire com country. And Chile leads the way in innovation and in Latin America. Round of applause again. So if anyone can fly a CubeSat in space, it's going to be the students of Chile, anywhere from 85 years old to five years old. This is it right now in space, that little cube flying. You can fill it with whatever you want. But we also do 3D printers, and we can print a new jaw if you need it. We can print new ears or a bladder if you need it. And weather, climate is very important to Chile. We're going to improve the air quality because we're testing it out with this high airplane that can fly up to the stratosphere look up at space weather, but also look down into your climate and to your agriculture, terra farming. These are tiny computers, so small they fit into the palm of your hand. And these are the components that make it work. But what else fits in the palm of your hand? Anyone ever heard of a show called Star Trek? Awesome, you all look way too young. But there used to be this thing called a tricorder. You wave it over yourself and it tells you how your vital signs are doing. It's real and it's a lot smaller than this. If you put the palm of your hand out, it fits in your palm and it can tell you all about what's going on inside your body. But if that's still too big for you, look at the size of your thumbnail. This can slip under your skin and it can tell you how your diabetes is doing, how your pneumonia is doing, if you have cancer that's getting out of control, and then it'll deliver the medicines to treat it. These are all around today. The other thing that we do, cyborgs, human robots. This is actually the face of the gentleman who makes up a robot in the Smithsonian Institute. The skin is real. The mechanic pumps make for a real heart, 
lungs, spleen, organ. This is today. So if you need something like that, we know how to engineer it now. And then suspension exercise. Anybody want to be weightless here in gravity without going to space, but you still want to float? Suspension exercise. Keep an ear out. It's a way to float in gravity. How would you like to do two hours of exercise in only 20 minutes without feeling hot, sweaty, tired? Come away feeling strong, alert, empowered. In that case, it's time to float on Earth with suspension exercise. And this is one of my last but not least innovations that I love. This is Chile, biodegradable plastic bags. You're going from being waste-centric to growth-centric. You're taking trash bags that discard parts of life and upcycling them, repurposing them into garment and food bags. Now you're feeding your country. Now you're clothing your country. Congratulations, Chile, on your 2012 Global Innovation Index Award, being in the top 50 countries. Wow, this is your year of innovation. Keep rocking it out. Round of applause. So I'm going to close with, what is the face of innovation? This is the at Atlas mission. It's also the Atlas rocket. But Atlas was also a Greek god. So is the face of innovation, this Atlas rocket, be it a rocket or a Greek legend carrying celestial bodies on his shoulder? Or is the face of innovation this woman bearing the weight of the world on her back? Or is the face of innovation this 85-year-old woman digging for roots at the banks of the Amazon for medicines? Or is the face of innovation this 18-year-old veteran with winged wheels for feet? Or is the face of innovation this mirror what you see every morning that you wake up. Could the face of innovation be you? So innovation is where it's happening. And innovation is no further away from us than simply the space between your ears. Somebody told me that he didn't see, think of his brain when he saw that. He thought of his music. So what would you fill the space between your ears up with if you could innovate anything? So when it comes to innovation, just remember, when you innovate in a world that knows no boundaries, there is always space. For all. Thank you, Chile, love you. Thank you.